welcome to the round table on the future of global computing education. And we're going to contextualize this within a project that John and I are working with that is sponsored by the two major uh, professional societies, the IEEE and the ACM. And we represent uh, both those institutions here today. So uh, we're going to tell you a little bit as, a, as an introduction about the, the history of all of these projects and where we, we have a supportive point of departure. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the future and then we're going to talk, uh, or rather we're not going to talk so much at all, but we're going to try to encourage you to talk and to share your ideas about where you think uh, our discipline and our professions are going over the next 10 to 20 years. So the first part, presentation of the, the project itself. So CC 2020, Computing Curriculum for 2020. Uh, we're going to give an overview of the structure, the goals, and, and the background, because this is grounded in work that actually began way back in the early 2000s, and in fact, even before that. Uh, I'm going to give a, a bit of an overview into what I think is going on in higher education and learning and perhaps to that effect it'd be good if both John and I uh, actually introduced ourselves so that you know who on earth we are. So as you can tell from my accent, I'm from Australia, Arnold Piers is my name. Uh, today I'm Professor and Head of Department of the Department of Learning and Engineering Sciences at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. But I have a background in computer science and a PhD in computer architecture design with a focus on, on parallel programming from the mid-90s. So I've worked in, in higher education in Australia, in France, and in Sweden over the last 25 years or so, uh, working mostly in, in computer science. Uh, now I have more of a focus, general focus on engineering education, and we're trying to promote a more holistic view of that sort of education. Now I'll let John introduce himself. I'm John Ampagliazzo, uh, Emeritus uh, Professor from Hofstra University in New York. Um, I've been involved with uh, curriculum and uh, edu com computing education and computer engineering education for decades. Uh, re most recently, I was on the IT 2017 uh, curriculum uh, committee, which issued its report in December of last year. And uh, I chaired the Computer Engineering Curriculum Committee, which was a joint adventure between ACM and IEEE. Uh, I have many, many years of uh, experience, and uh, I think we should just get going on this. Okay? Exactly. All right, so let's kick ourselves off. Part one is really John, so I'm going to leave that to him. Okay, uh, let me try to get this going. Okay, this is working. All right, I'd rather stand up rather than sit down with this. So um, what I'm going to uh, do here is to give you a brief overview, hopefully within 10 minutes, of um, what this project uh, CC2020 is about. Um, first of all, uh, its goals are sort of lofty, but uh, we believe achievable. Uh, first of all, there was a document in 2005, CC 2005, which um, is probably one of the most cited documents in computing education around the world. Um, and people know that document from the diagrams that were in it, which I'll show you briefly. Um, this project, CC 2020, Computing Curricula 2020, uh, is supposed to be very, very futuristic in its vision. And it's looking a uh, vision of 2030. Um, so things that are going to emerge from the report, which hopefully will be published in 2020, should have a 10-year life uh, to them. And um, what it uh, also will try to do is to visualize what computing is about. Um, by some type of contemporary, meaning web-based uh, tool so that uh, industry could use it, faculty members could use it, institutions could use it as a benchmark or as a guide uh, for 
curricula development, and, uh, and so forth. And many of the curricula reports that you may know about, like CS 2013, uh, Computer Engineering 2016, um, they are all passe. In fact, Information Systems is from 2010. So um, we expect that there will be future curricula reports in, uh, uh, in the next few years. And uh, the, this document this, that will be the report, CC 2020, will be a pathway for those new curricula areas, okay? So um, one of the things that uh, we try to do here is to ensure that we had global participation. Um, global participation, as you see, we have a task force of 36 people representing 16 countries and six continents. Uh, one of the criticisms of the past was the curricular reports that emerged were very US-centric, which I totally agree, and did not have the perspective from pe many people around the world. Sometimes there was a token person on a committee or something like that, but we really felt that it was unfair um, to the global community of computing and computer engineering that it be, uh, you know, just one-sided or one perspective. So this is that idea. And a subset of that uh, task force is a steering committee of currently 13, maybe it'll go up to 15 people, representing, I don't remember how many countries in that, but at least uh, eight or nine countries in that group. And um, the co-chairs are, one is from the States and one is from New Zealand, okay? And uh, they, one each represents the ACM from New Zealand, uh, Alison uh, Clear and uh, Alan Parrish from the United States for the Computer Society of IEEE. So um, one of the focus of this report is going to be on competencies, okay? In other words, the CC 2020 project has already decided that uh, it's going to be a competency-based document. Um, it's no longer necessary to just have knowledge, okay? We need to have competency. And there's always a um, confusion between what is a learning outcome and what is a competency. I won't read these to you, okay? But you see, there is a difference because competency is an ability of an individual to do a job, okay? It's a set of behaviors that provide a structured guide enabling identification, evaluation, and development of these behaviors in individual employees or students. So I've got this from the web. It came from a uh, sort of a business dictionary. But you see that there's, a, there's more dimension to competency. It's deeper. It's not just the learning, okay? It's actually more focused on doing it within a context, usually a corporate or business or organizational environment. Uh, if we go to the IT uh, report, that's the information technology report that was um, um, published in December, uh, we see that uh, the, these definitions are, are, again, reiterated in a different format. In essence, and not to dwell on this, uh, we'll leave the slides with the conference so you could just take them and use them, okay? But in essence, uh, the IT 2017 report has focused on competency as being uh, a canonical three-dimensional form involving knowledge, involving skill, technical skill, and human disposition within some kind of context. So I have known many people, including faculty members, who were so knowledgeable could answer any question about a particular subject that they were uh, familiar with and could not change a light bulb, okay? They simply had no ability to do anything beyond what they memorized. And we have many people who just do memorization and, and can pass exams, but that's insufficient for the marketplace, okay? 
just because someone graduates with a 4.0 or top average doesn't mean they're good in the marketplace. All right, they may be misfits, in fact. Um, and so the IT report has this diagram, which we hope becomes somewhat famous, which shows that the knowledge and the skills and the dispositions are three different packages, three different things, but their intersection is what generates this competency. And uh, it's done in professional context. So it could be workplace bound, or it could be a expert mentorship, it could be collaborative learning, it could be project based, it could be in some kind of entity where you have the competence. Think of it, would you like to be performed surgery on you by a medical doctor who knew everything in the book, could memorize everything in, in, law, in medicine and could not do an operation on you because they were not competent? You would never use them. So why should we use an engineer or a computer person who, ha who is not competent, okay? So this is our stress here. Now, um, the CC 2005, I'm just gonna go through this within a few seconds, so I'm gonna flash through a bunch of slides, but I think you've, most of you may have seen them before. And that is that we try to make a visualization in CC 2005 to talk about the way we would represent the field of computing, the entire field of computing, okay? And the vertical axis represented stratas of, of levels of things from hardware and architecture, which is the nuts and bolts, to the top part, which is organizational and, and system issues. On the horizontal, we had the very theoretical on the left and the very applied on the right. And I think you've seen these before. If you looked at computer engineering as a discipline, it has gone from theory to practice, but on the lower end where it belongs with circuits and wires and things of that, embedded systems nowadays, okay? Um, computer science is very theoretical. All right, we know that, but it doesn't go into hardware too much. It doesn't go into, it doesn't do payrolls and inventory uh, systems, okay? Robotic systems, okay? Maybe it talks about algorithms of robotics, but no, nothing beyond that. Okay, information systems is very systems oriented. That's what makes the banks run and the grocery stores run, okay? Um, the uh, information technology is very hands-on with no theory, hardly theory. Uh, in fact, it's very difficult today to find a PhD in information technology, right? But they exist. Rochester Institute of Technology produces them, okay, and others, but they're not too many, right? And finally, uh, software engineering. That was the easy one to do because software engineering was very in the middle of the road. It's software and it didn't get involved too much in the other parts. Now, I was in charge of these diagrams, okay, back in 2003, 2004, 2005. Do you know how long it took to draw these pictures? A year and a half, okay? Because when you have a committee of academics, okay, they want it a little more this way and a little more that way. But we uh, compromised, and this is what we came up with. If you take all of those areas and you overlap them, you get the union of all of these areas, and then you have all of computing. And this CC 2005 report also has tables, okay, which I'm not going to represent here, we don't have time, that talks about um, the cognitive uh, weight of computing topics, non-computing topics, there's the soft skills uh, things, okay, and the performance for graduates. In other words, these three tables are often overlooked because people just jump to the pictures in the report. But the, uh, the, the other ta these tables are quite good and they show you, at least from the 2005, okay, what people thought about where things belonged in that area. So, 
uh, the whole point of all of this is to replace this with something more modern, to be something more futuristic, something out of the box. And when we get into the debate in about 10 minutes, we're going to ask you to what you would like to see in the 2020 report, which will be about the future of computing. So now we'll turn it over to my colleague, Arnold, and uh, thank you. Look at that, that even works, incredible. I can't be a scientist, I could use technology. Um, all right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about education out of the box. Um, I think we need to be a little bit careful if we're going to try to visualize what education is going to look like in 2030 or 2040 or 2050. It's actually a pretty long time into the future and it, if you look back as a way of looking forward, we can ask ourselves, okay, so for those of us who took our education in the 80s and the 90s, how much does that differ from the type of education that we deliver to our students today? And maybe it doesn't differ actually all that much sometimes. So we can ask ourselves, what has been going on? Well, I would claim at least these four points. Actually, our scholarly culture has changed dramatically. The way that universities address undergraduate education has moved much more towards mass production of graduates for industry, and it's less about producing a cultural and intellectual elite than it was 30 or 40 years ago. And so we can ask ourselves also, you know, how does that change the demands on the type of education that we deliver? Um, amongst other things, actually, is it even relevant to give courses anymore? I mean, we all have huge investments in our universities. We have buildings, we have built whole campuses, we have infrastructure that, in some sense, constrains our ability to do something different because we have these enormous investments and we'd like to use them for something. Um, one of the things that we have, though, invested enormously in over the last 20 years is digitization of education. We all remember the MOOC movement, right? 2009, 2010, people were telling us that online education and particularly MOOC was going to drive most universities out of business. By the time you got to 2050, there'd only be five or six universities left in the whole world, and they'd be mostly online because nobody wanted to go to campuses anymore. Well, you know, we can argue about that type of rhetoric, but it was a vision of the future. I don't think that we're going there very fast because MOOC actually turned out not to be the thing that people thought it was, and there are some reasons for that. Some of them linked to the social nature and the constructivist nature of, of education and motivation. It's hard to be motivated in a virtual environment. We need to work more on that. But it's quite clear that this digitization process is disrupting our business model. It's disrupting the way that we deliver information to people. And it's certainly changing the way people expect to prepare themselves for educational situations. If you're engaging with people nowadays, the likelihood is that they have Googled whatever it is you're talking about. My wife's a medical practitioner, she's an orthopedic surgeon, and she reports to me that patients come in and they already think they know what the problem is because they've Googled their symptoms, right? Which presents the medical practitioner with a problem. Either they're an expert and their diagnosis and, and examination of the patient is what lays the ground for, for a future operation, or maybe it's Dr. Google. And then the question is, you know, which of these sources do you value? And what's your perception of those sources in ter terms of your own personal agency? Because people are very active in this environment now. So increasingly, universities are seen to be a sort of a mechanism for credentialization. You come to me and I measure that you know something, but I don't actually necessarily give, the, give you the knowledge myself. And that's one of the reasons why we're moving away from the knowledge-based approach. We need to focus on what people can perform, what they can do, uh, what they're capable of demonstrating to us, rather than the content of what went into our courses in the assumption that we can infer something from the fact that we put 
content into courses, into these boxes, these packages, and then we made people suffer through them, irrespective of whether they needed the content of the box or not. So we have a real problem there. But now, instead of that, I think if we look to this curriculum, instead of telling people what to put in boxes, then as John says, we can move towards, well, what should people be able to do and leave it up to each individual culture, each individual university to work out what should go into the box in order to get there. Because that will vary. And it won't just vary on the basis of culture or university or the background of your learners. We could tailor this to individuals. If we're really serious about digitalization, we shouldn't be talking about online courses. We should be talking about something completely different something that is much more fine grain where, I mean, if you, again, based on the research that we're doing, how do students, a typical student in a university, use MOOC courses? I actually did a study of this. I went out and I interviewed students who were learning programming. I recruited a whole bunch of them out of the university student population. They were learning Java programming from different MOOCs. But what was the average student behavior? They don't enrol for one MOOC, they enrol for five from different places. They don't complete any of them, but they do an assignment over there that they thought was relevant. They read that thing, they watch that video lecture. They're educational browsers. They're like cows out in the field eating only the flowers, right? They're trying to get all the best bits and tailor it to themselves because they have this much more online, a demand-driven, I want to know, curiosity-driven way of approaching their education. And when we structure a very front-designed, heavy-duty university education, in some sense we stifle these types of learners, would be my claim. Okay, so what's going on? What's all the fuss about? Well, we've said it's about reaching new learner groups. We've said it's about eliminating geographical limitations, but we're not very good at doing that yet. But digitalization could be a way there. It could be about disassociating the whole of this from time and space. You should be able to participate in education wherever you are, whenever you are, when it suits you. University campuses don't meet that need at the moment, and neither do online environments. But if we're going to realise that for our computing students, that you should be able to pick up a knowledge atom, a knowledge component, on the fly, exactly when you need it, exactly contextualised in your situation, our discipline should be able to make that possible for people, right? Everybody's going on about how AI is going to re revolutionise the world, how big data gives us the power to do all these sort of things. Okay, so what are, the, what are the corresponding challenges for us as a discipline? We, this is our discipline, this is our knowledge base, these are our algorithms. AI, big data, learning analytics, we should be able to do something really innovative in this space. The other thing is this. Now this is a, a, a very intuitive picture that actually has a very weak empirical research foundation, but it's interesting to think about because it drives a lot of what we do. Right? There's, a, there's a strong, uh, how can I put this, there's a strong gut feeling in most of us that synchronises with this picture. You know, we've all been doing a lot of this stuff up here. And it works really, really well for people who are like us, because that's why we're standing here. It worked well for us, the system selected for that, we are good at it, we ended up here. Are we typical, are we representative of our country's populations? No, we are not. We are the top X percent who were very rigorously selected. Not many people get to be professors in highly ranked universities around the world. Okay, so we cannot intuit from ourselves what our students need. That's my message. Um, Digitalisation gives us the ability to empower individuals to do all of these things that are further down. We can couple people together, we can use social networking, we can use online environments. But if we're going to do that, we need to consider the educational process from a different perspective. We can't focus on stuffing knowledge into people's heads and getting them to, to memorise things that, as John was just pointing out, could be completely useless in practice. We need to be able to place this in a contextualised environment. And really why we're here today is to try to collect some of your ideas about how that future could look, how we might think about this, how we collectively as a community can work on this. 
You know, John and I can sit in the steering group uh, and try to work on recommendations for what we should do, but without input from our own community, we only represent our own points of view. All right, so, you know, we really want to move from that down here. I want to give you two examples, oops, there we go, two examples of what's going on in places up in the north. One is that the, uh, the Finnish government have just announced, and especially the city of Helsinki, have announced that they're going to abandon subject-based curricula to a large extent. They're going to focus on a phenomenon-based educational system. Now, for those of us in the Nordic countries, this is a very interesting decision because the Finnish education system has been held up to be one of the best in the world for nearly a decade. It's the example that everybody else follows. So if Finland are deciding to do something radical, uh, maybe they have a good reason for doing it and we should start to think about what does phenomenon-based education mean and how does it really work and will this, can this succeed? So that's one thing that's interesting. Um, one of my colleagues at KTH has been very controversial as well and he's proposed that universities should try to break down the barriers between themselves and the rest of society in a more comprehensive fashion. I stole this out of his uh, idea material that's published on the web. Um, the idea is that citizen science, for instance, can be used to engage with learners at an early age and include them as a part of the university community. You enrol into a university for life. You begin already in primary school, contributing maybe to some uh, large-scale project through your own small observations in the field or through some other type of activity in your school. When you finally end up in the university environment, it's about building networks. It's about understanding how to navigate this learning atom cloud with the help of AI agents and other intelligent tutors, and also the staff, because the research staff of universities are not going away. That's what generates the, the continuous value of universities, new knowledge all the time. But how do we get our students to engage in that scholarly, scholarly domain? And then there's a big line here after graduation in many universities. We, we push our graduates out the door and say, okay, you're graduated now, out you go into the working life and we never want to see you again. Uh, we are a finished product. You know, you went through the process, we stamped you out, you look really good, uh, piss off and do some work. Um, not a very useful thing actually for us to do because not only do those working alumni have enormous competence which they could bring back into the university sector, but also uh, they need to continuously grow. There is increasingly a demand in computing for continuous professional development and universities should be a part of that. We shouldn't be shutting these people out just because they graduated. We should be involving them in our extended community and, and really you know, hugging them to our chests so that we don't lose that competence. And so you go on and on and on and you grow and grow and grow and this network should become richer and richer. Okay, so that was it from me. I mean, I, I'm very much for breaking down boundaries and saying, okay, so let's think completely outside the box. So let's hear what you have to say. How do we think outside the box in terms of what computing needs and what particularly you think a computing 2020 or beyond document should give to the community. So that's it for me. Thanks for listening. So now it's your turn. It's brainstorming time. So. Thank you very much. Um, I don't have a suggestion for a document I'd like to bring into disciplinary dimension. I represent a computer science program that's an add-on um, on another major. Yeah, so people take a major in finance or music or neuroscience and then they take um, something that's more than a minor and more than a, ma uh, more than a ma minor and less than a major. So I just have this thought that as we talk about all these competencies, what computing competencies are necessary for someone who's not going to be a computing professional but will involve um, computing in, in their work. So that was my question, one question. And then on the pyramid you've shown, um, there is lecture that's highly ineffective and then there is a collaboration that's 
more effective, but lecture can be done for 500 students and collaboration can only be done effectively with 25. So as we are facing this increase in enrollments, um, it's also good to think about this other axis of how scalable um, other methods that we use. And you know, d digitalization, that, uh, that was one hope that it would help us scale effective methods, but um, yeah, so these were two, two keywords I wanted to put in place, interdisciplinary and scale. Uh, what we'll do is, I'll t I made a note of that, we don't have the answer about how to develop competencies for interdisciplinary, but it'll certainly go back to the committee. Thank you. Uh, I have, uh, well, I had two questions. One question uh, was uh, somehow. Yeah, uh, yeah. Oh. okay. I, have had, I had two questions, which is kind of related, but it is a follow-up uh, to the question before. Uh, is really uh, currently, for, especially for university who offer all computing degrees, if you want to call them, like IT, software engineering, computer engineering, and computer science, there is always a confusion but, uh, you know, among the students and even among the faculty about the differences between the two which you showed uh, a transparency that shows the differences. Why not having a curriculum, computing curriculum that covers most the spec spectrum? This is always a question that students ask. How could I cover the whole computing spectrum in undergraduate degree okay. or a graduate and undergraduate? And the other question was related to a minor for, uh, Again, having a computing minor for other uh, engineering or non-engineering degrees. Okay, um, we will uh, bring that information back. Thank you very much, okay. But if I, if I can make a couple of comments in regard to the question about scale. I think collaboration can scale. It just needs to be mediated by technology in smart ways and we need to work out how to do that effectively. Um, and then, in regard to your points, yeah, I think we could do that, but then we need to understand what are the patterns of study that lead to successful careers, right? And so one of the things that I've envisaged that this report will help or, and the tools associated will, will help people with is that they'll be able to sort of metacode their, their study program and feed it into a tool and see, well, how does it compare to other programs around the world? How does it com what does it look like in terms of its shape in, in terms of these diagrams that, that John was presenting before. Because I think that's a useful intellectual tool for us. If I study this type of program, you know, students ask all the time, who do I become? And we have difficulty, you know, we say something fuzzy like, oh, you can become anything. And then they go, oh, well, anything means nothing. So I'm gonna drop out and become a nurse because then at least I know what I get to do when I graduate. Um, but computing, we're not good at telling people, well, if, if you take this pattern in this path and you focus on these things, then your future could look like this and this and this. And I, I hope that one of the things that we can tr contribute to that is just greater transparency there, you know, that we can give people more of a vision of who they could be. Those diagrams I showed earlier uh, that are in the CC 2005 report Originally, the committee got together around 2001 uh, to, uh, I guess, inform high school guidance counselors about the differences uh, in computing because uh, Johnny or Mary might want to study computers, okay? Well, what area of computing do you want to study? So part of the reason behind the CC 2005 report was to educate high school counselors, parents, and students about the differences between the computing types. So um, I, I think um, when we look at your question about the spectrum, okay, we'll have to see how we could address that and, uh, and, and, and take that into account. So, something else, someone else, yes, okay. I, I come from Brazil and I, in my university there is a very active computer science department that's now 40 years old. And then uh, during the celebrations there was a final talk and a very well-known professor 
uh, put the, fo the, the, the following um, goal for, for the computer science department. That he made a research in the US and realized that 30% of the staff of computer science departments were outsiders, not people related to computer science. And the point is that uh, computer science now like a, a, a language, you see, that provides several tools and the, qu the question is how to apply these tools in different areas. Um, how is this approach affecting the way uh, computer science is taught? So, I mean, this contact with different people who are uh, working at the computer, outsiders, compu uh, the computer science departments are affecting the views of people who, who do the job in computer science. Do I understand your question correctly? Is that you have 30% of people outside of computer science teaching computer science? Uh, working at the computer oh, science. Okay. Philosophers, uh, social scientists, and, and so on. And these people are the ones who uh, usually need support from computer science. Okay. And they are, of course, affecting the way computer science is uh, producing solutions for their problems. So this interaction, how is it affecting the way computer scientists think uh, when they have demands from outsiders? OK. Uh, I don't have a, it's a more of a philosophical question, and I don't have an answer for it. But if someone wants to engage in this here, uh, feel welcome to do so. Or the microphones are around, OK. Is this an answer to his question, or is it a separate? Well, we, we can ask ourselves, is computer science a discipline of its own, or is it a service discipline to other disciplines? And I think that's a, the, the kernel of your question. The people who are working in computer science departments who are not computer scientists are seeing computer science as a service discipline to their discipline. It, you can take the analogy to applied mathematics. Applied mathematics, in some sense, is is a service discipline to other disciplines that wish, wish to solve particular contextualised problems using mathematical tools. That's why it's applied. And so perhaps in some sense we have the same thing emerging in computing, that we've got central computing, computing for its own sake as its own discipline, and then we have applied computing. And applied computing is about uh, using computing in the context of another discipline in order to solve a disciplinary problem. I don't know, it's just a, yeah, an so idea. There was a question back there. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I, just to follow on from that, I guess, I, I agree with you. The idea, I'm not sure there's a clear line of who are um, outsiders and insiders when it comes to computer science. And I think it's quite uh, a broad spectrum. And one of the things about computing education, I would say, I, I work at the Open University in the UK, uh, working um, particularly in KMI, the Knowledge Media Institute, on so many disciplines now, uh, students need to handle data. They need to be familiar with ways of gathering, cleaning, uh, understanding, interpreting, processing data. They need to, a lot of things which are very traditional computer science subjects, core computer science subjects. They need to understand databases, how they work, um, as well as the, the semantics on top of that. Um, and actually, I think a major thing in future computing education will not be teaching students who want to learn about computing. It will be teaching computing-related topics uh, outside, in quotes, outside of computing. I yeah. think it's quite narrow to sort of focus on, well, how do we teach computer, computing science students to study computing, um, when I'm not sure it's that clear a boundary. That's just my thoughts, anyway. It's, in 1993, ACM published a series of curricular reports for what we call community colleges or two-year colleges. And one of the reports was computing for other disciplines. And so this may be something that uh, we can now bring into this uh, CC 2020 report uh, that uh, will allow us to think beyond our own computing areas and think about the other areas, as was mentioned earlier, about interdisciplinary. 
So computing for other, dis or other disciplines or some version of that is a good suggestion. Thank you. Uh, so there's a, all right, there's another question, and then there's one here. Okay. Yeah. okay. So regarding the, the idea about should we have just one computing degree versus several, um, I, might, I may be biased because my university, we have eight undergrad degrees in computing, but I don't really see a problem with that. I look at engineering, and we have several different sub-disciplines of engineering. Uh, some are very distinct. You know, chemical engineer versus a civil engineer has relatively little in common, but a chemical engineer versus a biomedical engineer, there's quite a bit of overlap. So I really think it's a matter of maturity and that as our profession continues, that we'll see better definitions of the sub-disciplines that we have today. Um, but the, one of the things I want to comment on is, um, you, know, you did a really nice job, I think, showing the difference between a learning outcome and a competency. But I have some concerns that as we increase our emphasis on competencies and yield to the young students and even society's demand on what do I need to know now, uh, are we moving toward more training versus education? And maybe we need some definitions and distinctions of those two terms. Uh, do you mean that competencies are more directed toward industry uh, needs? Because it, it implies that. It's what the students are able to actually do. Um, it yeah, implies I, industry more than graduate school. And I'm not saying this is a bad thing. Yeah. I'm just saying let's be clear on where we stand. That it does seem that over the past 30 to 40 years, and looking into the future, are, we're, we seem to be moving more in that direction of a um, just-in-time knowledge type of approach to things. And is that a good thing from the point of view of creativity and where we want to go with bigger ideas? Okay, that's a good I, point. I, I think that's hard to answer, but I, I wonder if it's not also bound to our cultural understanding of what competencies are because I think in my context, coming from, from Australia, where the, you know, a TAFE, a technical and further education college, that, what they did was they produced competencies in people and they went directly off to be technicians in, in industry. And so I have a cultural baggage that I bring along with me to any discussion of what competencies is. Um, what I discovered when I moved to Sweden was that people talk about competencies there, but they, there they talk about something, uh, I might mean, talk about uh, you talk about färdighet or förmågor, and a färdighet is, is a, something that is a sort of a, a capability, and a förmåga is like a capacity or an, an, a, a sort of forward-looking ability. Um, so there, there the, the discussion is not so loaded, and, and these things are seen to be integral to education and, in fact, are used in the official language in the higher education ordinance to talk about what the outcomes of, of uh, degree programs should look like in terms of what uh, graduates should be able to, to achieve and do in different contexts. So I think if we were clever enough to formulate good competencies that talk to educational objectives and, and broader personal growth rather than specific skills, but the responsibility for that lies in our community to be able to formulate and express uh, those goal patterns to ourselves and to others. So again, you know, we have to be very careful because this could also become a very dangerous project and very constraining. Yeah. Sorry, there's gentleman here has had yeah. his hand up for ages. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I want to make one statement uh, to this. Um, I think we, are, we should distinguish between computer science and computer application. Yeah. Yeah, in, in, in the most courses, especially courses for, for other disciplines, we we teach computer application. Yeah, maybe a little bit programming and modeling, but uh, it is not computer science. And I think at the moment we have we, we run in, an, in a situation where universities don't cover both of these ends. Yeah. They, they move from science to application. And from my point of view, we should keep the science. And here we come to what you, what you call uh, education atoms, something like that, which, which should be, let's say, um, usable in different contexts and, and 
somehow measurable. Um, we, we, we think about these kind of items for five years now. We call them items, not atoms, but you know, it's just a word. <laughs> um, and we're still struggling about the networking between these items, you know, because the, the idea is, of course, I agree, there, sh there is a path or a be the best path for each student through, let's say, the knowledge, the wisdom, whatever, the science, and to, to a target. But I still don't see the routing. The problem is that we have these not interconnected, you call them atoms, yeah, but I'm, I still think about the routing. Do you have any approaches on the routing? I, do. I think that's where AI has to come in and also more knowledge about the background of the learner. Because, I mean, what we offer today is we offer block education which is only partially relevant. So a person with a, a particular background is sort of put through a standard program as though they looked like a standard input. But in fact, if you think about information processing, I mean, it's all about handling different inputs. And in fact, we have a, a sort of a process-based system where we're, we're very routinized and, and we package in large blocks. It's not clear that that's, that's a good model anymore, but as you say, we don't understand the network that lies behind the finer-grained model properly. And so we would need to do some very sophisticated either data mining or thinking in our community in order to try to establish that, that routing protocol that leads to different outcomes. Yeah, I think it's a huge challenge. Um, I, I really like the, uh, the talk and the slides. I, I'd love to see a slightly more formalized framework. I, I've heard a lot of people, universities say that, you know, we can't do MOOCs. There's a lot of shortfallings in MOOCs and everyone will agree. And then we'll turn around and say, but we do want to offer online education and we do want to support continuing education. And you go right back to we're going to put videos online and we're going to have a lot of uh, feedback. So at some point you do get into the learning science where there's things we can do very well online for almost zero marginal cost from YouTube video to programming problems. And then there's things that you can't do very well online, which is getting students to ask a lot of questions, uh, cognitive constructivism, because they know they're going to get answers, uh, getting them working with other students and collaborating, uh, one of your nice 50% learning things, a lot of social constructivism, and, um, and the expert modeling, getting students to teach other students or being able to express it. And I always find that I'll be working with people who do an all online education and they want to say you can do everything online. And then other people who are class settings and like, no, 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 we, you can't do what I do online. And so if there was some framework where we could be very honest of here's things where technology really, really helps. And here's where places, if you do have time in a class with other students, with a faculty member at some interesting ratio, here's maybe where you should be spending more of your time, encouraging collaboration, uh, encouraging you know, expert modeling, uh, students asking questions, whatever that might be. So I don't know if I ever had a framework I could point people to so it wasn't just having those same conversations, I, th I think that might be helpful. Well, we're hoping that the 2020 report will establish some framework. It won't be, a, I don't think it'll be universally accepted, but it certainly would be a compromise of that so maybe uh, a chapter on cognitive science or cognitive learning, as you mentioned, might be a, a good idea uh, in this report, that it, it goes beyond the technical part and out of the box part. That's what we're looking for. We're looking at, to be futuristic. We want to have a report that has many options for many people, for many, for many cultures, because we can't say, this is the way it is. I think you, Arnold, you said it right, you know. We put things in a box and we say, open the box, learn it, and then go away. And we're, we're trying to say, we're, we would like to make a set of competencies, okay, for all of computing. In fact, that's one of the projects. Once we get all competencies from six disciplines, uh, the six disciplines right now are computer engineering, computer science, uh, information systems, information technology, software engineering, and, um, and cybersecurity. Those are the six areas. And we're probably going to have a seventh area in data science. When we try to get all of that together, okay, we're going to try to distill it in maybe, I don't know, a hundred statements. And, it's a, and they, these hundred statements are what we call all of computing 
Now, where do you fit if you are um, a, uh, let's say, uh, an interface between uh, computing and some other uh, area? For example, like was mentioned, uh, bioengineering and chemical engineering from chemistry and from biology. So we have these intermediate things. So I, that's probably a good idea to make it more appealing to the uh, global community. All right. So uh, can uh, I just check, because I'm taking notes now. If I heard you correctly, I mean, what you really were asking for was, I mean, that, that pyramid diagram is sort of useful in, in one dimension. But if we had a more generalistic framework that would help people to reason about how they position pedagogy uh, and resources and modes of teaching and so forth in regards to a, a sort of the delivery of the, of, the, of the competencies in curriculum. Is that what you were, you were asking for? Some sort of statement around that? Yeah. Uh, And for more people. Will not have the same either capability or intrinsic motivation. They will need additional teaching and learning methods. And it isn't clear to me there's a framework of as your students become less interested in the material or not as intrinsically motivated in the material, you're going to have to introduce more uh, conversation, more question asking, and more teaching. You got to get them to speak code and explain uh, things. You can't just have them doing online videos and online exercises because they will drop off and burn off. You know, it'll start looking a lot more like the MOOC uh, trail off, right. you know, completions. <laughs> and when you're teaching courses, at least at a university level, you have to have a much higher yield. You got to get 95 plus percent of the students through that course and at least learn the, the competencies that, that are needed as prereqs of the follow-on courses. Uh, so anyway, I, I liked what you said, if that somehow was in the framework of giving your teaching environment, here's some tools or techniques you should consider for certain of these competencies that you won't be able to do in an online setting, but if you have the opportunity to do them in a classroom, the learning science would recommend that you do. Okay, so, so that's useful because we can write a section of, of the materials that will deal with those types of questions. Lovely, okay. thanks. Great. Someone else, uh, there's this question here. Yeah. Hi. Um, oh, so okay. where when we... we... Where are we? <laughs> yeah. Ah, <laughs> okay. So uh, what I would like to add is when we talk about competencies that we need to teach uh, in computing, is that we should really stress also on that we should uh, teach people how to make things visual. And this is something that's very abstract when we talk about computing. But for example, there is very interesting work done by Google Brain called Distill, where they try to visualize how neural networks work. And I think that's very interesting because in this way you find like a meta, uh, like meta layer of how to do things, and you find a very easy way to uh, take different interpretations of something that you can do. And then this is basically also a way of teach, like when we looked at this pyramid, where we said like, okay, we need to, like actually people need to teach something if they want to understand it. Like making things visual, even if it's like some sort of an abstraction layer, is a way of teaching it to yourself. And then you can take this interpretation and talk about this with other people. So I would say that this, this question of how to make things visual um, can be very interesting because also in this sense you would have some sort of a product outcome of a learning, like a visual representation of what you understood, and that's something that human in general very like. For example, if you look at success from Instagram or something like that, that's something that people like to share if it looks beautiful. Thank you. So yeah, uh, in my case is not a question; is more a suggestion to consider how to teach or how to provide these competences. Because from my experience, I have seen that we are good on identifying the competences that we have to teach, but sometimes we forget about how they have to be teach. Because it's one thing is the theoretical part on. Okay, we have to achieve these uh, competences, skills, whatever. But the difficult part is how to combine all these technologies. Something that we have to be aware of is that not all the groups are the same, and we have 
somehow to adapt to them, um, make small changes. So I would suggest to add this teaching part and to put it like as, as an important thing because I, in my opinion, we, ha we are in a situation that we know pretty well what are the competences, but we're still missing the part on how to transmit that because we have like a very good professors that they have the whole knowledge as you said at the beginning of your presentation, but they don't know still how to transmit this uh, knowledge, information to the students. University life is a very strange breed. Uh, we seem to get a job in a department and we're asked to teach uh, 20, 50, hundreds, perhaps thousands of students and we have never taken even one hour of education on how to teach at all. We've never taken a pedagogy course. Now, in the United States, every elementary school teacher, every high school teacher has to be certified to teach, which means they've gone through a series of courses and know how to deal with different situations in the classroom. Um, in the university, we have no such thing. And I think it's probably an excellent suggestion on putting this in the report because um, without knowing how to convey the information uh, properly, we can easily turn off a whole class. I mean, a brilliant professor, okay, very knowledgeable with many published works, all right, would come in and destroy a class and make them just drop out. Okay, this usually happens in physics and in mathematics. Uh, that's why we don't have any math, t uh, prof uh, math majors anymore, hardly. Okay, they just don't bother because um, uh, the, the, the math professors go in and assume that they're just gonna teach everyone as if they were all going to be math majors. They, they have no sense of what's in the classroom. And I'm speaking, my PhD originally is mathematics. When I went to school, computer science did not exist as a subject, so I came through the hybrid way. Uh, but um, I, when I started my first job, they gave me the chalk, and here's the blackboard, and here's the textbook, and here's the syllabus, and go to it. They never, never even, not even one hour conversation with anyone about how to actually teach. So I think it's a very good point. Arnold, you're yeah, this is your area, so. Well, I was going to say, I, I, I mean, I can sympathise. I think we all came from that background. But the, um, the world is changing. I mean, in ma most of the Nordic countries now, you, you can't get tenure in a, in a university without having between 10 and 15 weeks of pedagogical training. And you have to demonstrate that you've, you've done it and that you are capable of deploying it in the classroom. And increasingly also, I think there is a an expectation that people will have a teaching and learning portfolio that's taken seriously uh, when people are, are considered for appointments. So at least in some parts of the world, uh, things are changing. But perhaps we need to take a broader grip on that and make yeah. a recommendation in this right. report. I yeah, think absolutely. It's very good. Then there were two other well, hands there were I saw. Some other people, maybe. I don't know who's there. Over here. Okay. Oh, there's one over there. She was quicker. <laughs> If I got it correctly, you said that in 2050 there will be like five or six universities worldwide and um, every ed education will be done purely online. Um, I'm not really sure whether I'm looking forward to that because um, from my experience when I'm um, interacting with the students in my lecture hall, um, I, I realize that most of the stuff I do is diagnosing what an individual needs next as a next step or as a next help item to move onwards on the indi individual learning path. And um, this that diagnosis, um, I'm doing it sort of systematically, systematically but also with lots of um, gut experience. And I don't really see that um, artificial intelligence will help us within the next 15 or 20 years to um, maybe it, it will support us to in the diagnosis process, but, but um, um, creating the, the next help item that's necessary to help an individual student, um, this is still something that um, needs an experienced lecture because it does not only have to address the technical aspects of the teaching, but also base competencies such as diligence or abstract thinking or analytical thinking or logical thinking, um, which I th I can't really see yet um, how a system can foster these skills in all their complexity um, 
in a systematic way, purely automatically. I clearly sp spoke too quickly earlier. What I, what I actually said was that the MOOC originators claimed that that would be the case, but okay. I didn't believe it either. Mm -hmm. um, I totally agree with you. I don't think that an online environment can replace the high value interaction that we have between human beings in learning situations. But as was re remarked upon by one of the other uh, people in the room, it's difficult to scale that. You know, I, I, can, I can understand that Oxford and Cambridge still have the economic background to provide these very small tutorial based individual uh, curriculum, uh, personal growth type uh, educational environments, but many universities don't have those economic resources. And so I think it's exactly as you say, that what we need to look at is how do we integrate intelligent systems with our mm -hmm. own value add, because we do add a value. Otherwise, we might as well give up now and all go home. Mm -hmm. But I think we really need to believe very, very firmly in ourselves and in the fact that we really do add something to the student experience. So yeah, I, I agree with you. You're, you're quite correct. Well, we switch to the next speaker. Um, I just wanted to mention at Hofstra University, from where I'm from, uh, the professors, some of the professors in the School of Education that teach pedagogy never spent one hour in the classroom, you know, either elementary or high school, okay? It's kind of strange. They're highly published, but they have never taught a student in their life other than their graduate students. So it's, it's something we really need to discuss. I'm sorry I digress, but it's go ahead. me, okay. I think that in the future, the young people will tailor their own formation. I mean, they will pick the disciplines. They decided to study, for example, psychology. They will pick the disciplines from different universities, collected the, the certificates. And I think we should think about a way to recognize or certificate uh, the, their choices of professional, as professionals. Okay. Um, there is a big deal concerning uh, how to create an innovation environment for students at universities. How do you think that com com uh, computer science can help us to create this environment? How can it foster innovative ideas, not only think inside the box or, you see, Could you elaborate? <laughs> yes, my question is, one of the big challenges of, for universities nowadays is to create or to make itself an innovation environment where people can bring about new ideas, can think outside the box. That's, and how computer science can help people to, to build up such an environment. Okay. <laughs> Do you have any suggestions? I, I think I there are when you many. When say computer science, I think you mean all of computing, not just the small area of computer science, right? Well, you computer, computer science, science, science departments, you, you oh, cover a wide range. Okay. Um, well, one of the things is to have incubator type programs on campus where students could work with industry and, you know, to have, uh, do you know what I mean by incubator programs? Many, not many, but some universities uh, have on their campus a special area where industry can rent small space for maybe two or three people for very inexpensive rent, okay? Very, very inexpensive. They get electricity, uh, heating and air conditioning, and uh, I guess internet access, and that's it. A table and chairs. And, uh, and these are startup companies, and these startup companies uh, form like these little incubators. In fact, they're called incubator communities uh, within the campus, and then students can go there and explore new ideas, and they get credit as an internship, or they get credit for you know uh, work industry, uh, work study program, 
it might be a course uh, of some sort, uh, but they do, students do get recognition for doing that. It's not just a part-time job. So that's one way. I don't know of other ways, but there might be people who might suggest other ways to foster innovation. Okay, so I think we had a comment. Oh, okay, all right. Hi, I wanted to make a couple of points. Uh, the first is I was quite interested in your basing it on competency. Uh, because certainly in the UK, a recent study of jobs in this area revealed that there's no consensus on titles of jobs in the industry. And in fact, within the same organisation, the same job might have completely different titles. So unpacking that and seeing the competences that might be required, I think, is quite a challenge. Uh, the other point I wanted to make, certainly, again, in the UK now, they've introduced encoding within schools down at primary age. And so if you're really future-proofing for 2030, I think it's quite interesting because uh, we as universities in the UK are thinking how do we change our curriculum and change what we provide as these students come through, having done programming from the age of five or six. Currently, our students probably won't have done any programming till secondary school. And, and that would be quite a challenge because if you're talking about the competences of where they go out, I can see us raising our level uh, as they come through. Um, and then the other, I, I think what's really important is something uh, I came across called digital fluency. And I don't know whether you've considered that, but I think as we move forward, because this area changes so rapidly compared to other subjects, it is equipping students that come out with that digital fluency to take on whatever happens in the future. And five years ago, data scientist wasn't a job, and now it is. So. Um, I think making sure that those students are equipped for that is really important. And then the last thing, and it's a, it's a question back to you, is how will you ensure that your report is inclusive? Uh, because uh, there has there and there have been recent reports about the use of language and so on, especially in uh, areas like this that might be fairly male-dominated, and you can end up with quite gendered language. Uh, but there's, there's more to it than that about being inclusive. So I'm quite interested in how you make... Yeah. Um, the, your final report and the curriculum you're generated inclusive? Uh, to answer your last uh, question, um, there is a, a great effort in the 2020 project to have a common nomenclature um, so people understand the same words for the same thing. We don't know how to do it. Uh, we're thinking of building an ontology of some sort or a glossary of meaning. Uh, we've adopted one word so far as common, and that's the word computing, which to mean all of computing as opposed to informatics and ICT. And uh, For example, in New Zealand, uh, a course is a degree, and a paper is a subject or a course. Now, uh, even in the discussions here, we, I had to make translations in my mind what people were meaning when they used certain words. And um, this is a challenge for the 2020 project. I, I, I don't think it'll be totally successful because there's so many different variations of this, but I think if we could at least establish some common words and say this is what we call things, that would be good. How could it be inclusive? We've tried our best to include as many people from as many organizations, uh, computing groups, the Japanese Information Processing Society, the Chinese Computing Federation, um, uh, we, the, the, uh, the uh, South American um, SCI, um, SCI, uh, Brazil has the uh, society we have a member on the committee from Brazil. We have uh, one from South America representing CLAY, which is the South American group. We've tried our best. We hit six continents. We apologize. We could not find anyone from Antarctica who would be on the committee. Uh, but um, uh, of course, I'm saying that in jest. But it's, uh, it, if you have any suggestions on how else we could make it inclusive, uh, we will, um, our committee, like I said, comes from 16 different countries, probably representing 10 computing societies around the world. Um, we have Russia, we have all over uh, India, the Indian Computing Society. 
So they are all, they're all members of this, either the steering committee and, and at least the task force. They're on the task force. And if anyone wishes to contribute to the project, we will also have contributors and we welcome um, people from around the world. So um, uh, that is, uh, that's how our model is so far. Can I think. I don't hear him, sorry. So I, I was going to actually follow that up. I'd like oh, to know right, what okay. your definition of inclusive is because um, it means very many different things to okay, different another, people. Another nomenclature. I mean, there, yeah. there's, there's, a, there's a, a language usage thing. Just You could exclude people just by using the term credit hours, for instance, in a, in a document because credit hours means nothing to me in, in Sweden. Yeah. Um, and it gives a very American, US-centric sort of impression of such a document. That's one type of exclusivity or non-inclusiveness. But the whole thing of, of uh, non-excludingness is very, very difficult uh, at a, in a general level, I would say. It, are we talking gender? Are we talking cultural expectation? Are we talking... Uh, ability to access the resources that we provide. Are they going to be translated into multiple languages? Are they going to be accessible to the sight impaired? Are they going to be accessible to the blind? Uh, how do they serve different uh, ethnographic communities? There are so many dimensions to this question, so you probably need to specify and then I can... I am talking in that wider sense of equality, diversity and inclusiveness. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm wondering, as well as the countries you've got, have you looked at the diversity of that set of people that you've got in terms of gender, age, background, race, ethnicity and so on? We, we have indeed done that. I yeah. mean, we, of course, are not perfect. Nobody really can be. But we, I would say that in comparison to previous uh, working groups of this nature, the level of diversity in all dimensions is much greater than it has been in the past and we hope that that will help to produce a more balanced set of resources that are that people are able to engage with from different cultural and and other perspectives so we're aware of it that's the first step at least all right we have time i think uh, for one, yeah, or, one or two, two more, more questions because i think we're fighting lunchtime now okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, my name is Enric Sancho, I'm from the University of Minha in Portugal, and uh, we have all the, the, the same problems, uh, mostly. And um, I wonder if, if uh, we, we need to make here a distinction between, uh, between the, the, um, the level of knowledge or, if you want, the level of expertise that is required for each competencies. Because we have different uh, disciplines or different courses, and they require um, more or less the same competence, but with different levels of, uh, of, uh, for different students. And uh, also we have some students that come into the system, they really know what they want, and they, they you know, those that, you, you, that Arnold referred, uh, um, they, they, when they, they, they go to Harvard or some university like this, you don't, feel, you don't need to, to, to be a teacher there because the students learn by themselves. Mm. And it's completely different from what you need to do in a, in a country where you need to, to put the, the, the students' awareness and make them, convince them that the jobs that they, they, they need require those, those skills. And those, uh, it's a completely different uh, scenario. So. I don't know if we, if we need to framework all these questions also. I think it's worth addressing, at least the conversation. Um, so, I mean, we do it all the time. Physics does it, you know, physics for and physics majors and then physics for poets. Um, we, tro we do it in computer science. There's the, the classical intro to computer science programming class and C++ or something, and then we have uh, CS0, as they call it, uh, computing for all. Um, um, so you think the report should reflect this type of thing and how to address it? Okay. All right. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, Manuel, did you want to make an announcement for lunch about where it is and everything? Yeah, okay. yeah one more question. Or Thank you. Yeah. Is it on? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's not quite a question, but uh, well, I'm from math and I teach engineering from different degrees. And one of the things that I found um, 
a little bit critical in the computer science students is the, their non-ability to communicate. Um, the other, the other engineering students somehow they they are able to create relation between the teachers and the, and between the school and come back after when they are in the in the enterprises and and really work together. And the the computer science students are really inside themselves and introverts yeah <laughs> and sometimes it's difficult to to establish a relation with them and to and to get them to communicate rather or, or written or or oral communication is really difficult so i think it's a competency that they should be um, obliged to acquire okay um let ah. me just uh, mention uh, one or two things for wrap up um we have taken notes, we will digest them, and uh, we will report back to the CC 2020 group. Um, if anyone wishes to be involved in this in any way, um, just uh, provide us with your name, affiliation, and email address, and somehow we'll get you in the loop. Uh, we've had volunteers, we must have now about 100 volunteers who want to be part of this. Maybe it's to review the documents as because we'll have versions of them as they come out, you know, intermediate versions. So if anyone uh, wishes to do that, uh, just leave us your business card or give us your name, address, et cetera. And, uh, and after that, I would say, um, uh, by the way, if you do that and you do contribute, you will get recognition in the report. There'll be a section for reviewers. There'll be a section for contributors. Okay, and, and so you'll be part of the process. And uh, with that, I think uh, we're in lunchtime, so. <laughs>